in Psalm 46, David gives two commands. And the first one is this, come behold the works of the Lord. Behold, come, perceive them, look at them, watch them. Eugene Peterson says this about beholding. This requires patient attentiveness and energetic concentration. Everybody else is noisier than God. The headlines and neon lights and amplifying systems of the world announce human works. But what of God's works? They are unadvertised but also inescapable if we simply Look, they are everywhere. They are marvelous. But God has no public relations agency. He mounts no publicity campaign to get our attention. He simply invites us to look, to behold. The second command David gives in this psalm is to be still and know. Know that I am God. In the same piece, Eugene Peterson writes, when we are noisy and when we are hurried, we are incapable of intimacy. Not just with God, but with everyone. Deep, complex, personal relationship. If God is the living center of redemption, it is essential that we be in touch with and responsive to that personal will. If God has a will for this world and we want to be in on it, we must be still long enough to find out what it is. For we certainly are not going to learn by watching the evening news. Baron von Hugel, who had a wise word on most subjects, always held out that nothing was ever accomplished in a stampede. Behold the works of God and be still. And know God. Know the Lord. Both actions require a calm and patientness, which I can tell you right now, I do not have. It's not a passive uh, demeanor, though. It's not just to sit back and I'm going to see what happens. No, it requires attentiveness. It requires a lot of energy to behold, to be still, and to know. I don't know about you, but for me to focus, it takes almost everything I have to do it. It takes very little mental acuity to be distracted. That's the default and that we're in. For us to be focused, it takes a lot of energy from us. For some of us, more than others, because of the way we're wired. That's not passive. That requires a calm and patience to behold and to know. This is what John the Baptist is doing right here. He is drawing everyone's attention. Not with not with this, this, this passive demeanor, but with action. And he's not drawing attention to himself. He's drawing it to Jesus. He says, behold and know the Lord. Know Jesus. Behold the works of the Lord. John 1, 29 through 30. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, ahead said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me. Because he was before me. Now, this is a really unique phrase that John pulls out. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is not like a phrase that he's quoting out of the Old Testament. I mean, there's lots of imagery of lamb, and I want to go through what he, those things that he may be referencing there. But I really think this is a phrase that God gives John in this moment. I don't think John really fully comprehends what he's totally saying is. He knows Jesus is the chosen one. At least now he knows at this point. 
but he uses the Lamb of God. I mean, maybe he's referring to the Passover Lamb. He would have been familiar with this concept, the Passover Lamb, right? The Passover, which, which was used in the Exodus, right, where you slaughter, God instructed the Israelites to slaughter the Lamb, to put his blood over the lintel of your door, right, so that God would pass over the judgment upon you. And those that didn't have it, he would wipe out the firstborn. And that's how he freed the Israelites out of Egypt. Jesus is that Passover lamb that frees us. He's the lamb slaughtered. Or perhaps he's the gentle lamb that John is referring to in Jeremiah eleven nineteen. 19. But I was like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter. I did not know that it was against me they devised schemes saying, let us destroy the tree with its fruit. Let us cut him off for the land of the living that his name be remembered no more. This idea that, that God is this gentle lamb that is slaughtered, much like the Passover lamb. Or perhaps Jesus, he's referring to Jesus as the lamb in Genesis 22 in replace of Isaac. Ram, lamb, it's the same kind of concept here, right? Where Isaac was going to be sacrificed, Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac on the altar, and then God tells him to stop at the last moment and provides an animal to sacrifice. The Lamb of God. And of course, we know in that story, God doesn't require any of us to sacrifice our children. He's the one that sacrifices his son for us. Or perhaps he's the lamb that's in Isaiah 53, this lamb that's the servant of the Lord. Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet opened not his mouth like a lamb that has led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. What's kind of fascinating here is, is the Aramaic word for servant is the same as the word for lamb. So here it is. The Hebrew is playing with this concept that the servant of the Lord is the lamb of God, is the one that will be sacrificed. And this death deals with the, our transgressions that this lamb takes on. Or perhaps... And what I think is the most enjoyable imagery in the whole uh, scripture is that in Revelation, this lamb that has led to the sacrifice and the slaughter turns into a triumphal lamb, a warrior lamb. Let's get that picture in your mind. A lamb wielding a sword or fighting or in battle. In Revelation 7.17 7, and 17.14, For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And then verse 14, they will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them. For he is the Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. This warrior Lamb who is triumphant. And of course, we know, right, what all the scriptures say. How is this lamb triumphant? Through sacrifice, through his death, in which he defeats all the enemies of God. And then he uses this phrase, take away the sins of the world. It's this connection in the New Testament with this lamb that, that takes away the sins in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, 5, 7. Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened, for Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. I mean, John doesn't understand this really point. I right here what's going on when he says this. For the lamb of God has takes away the sins of the world. But here it is later on. Paul's right, he's describing as this God-given description of what's actually happened. That the lamb dies and takes our death. And we die with this lamb. So that the old leaven goes away and that we are new but we're not leaven we're unleavened we no longer have sin right this, this idea that leaven is sin leaven is a thing that some, makes something rise and uh, often in the new testament that is equated with sin it doesn't mean if you eat leavened bread that you are eating sin it's not what it means eat leavened bread we can do it but this but it says like you really aren't given a new leaven you really are unleavened because you're united with the lamb who's died for you you're united in his death and his resurrection and you're given new life because of the sacrifice in Ephesians 5 2 and walk in love as Christ loved us walk in his love to how he loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and a sacrifice 
to God. This love offering that is a sacrifice. Colossians 1, 13-14. He has delivered us, the Lamb, from the domain, the, the domain of the darkness and transferred us, delivered us, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we are in the Son, we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Because we are united to him, the Lamb of God, our sins are taken away. And he delivers us and he transfers us from the kingdom of the world, the kingdom of darkness, to the kingdom of light, to the kingdom of heaven. In Hebrews 2, 14 through 15, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook in the same things, our flesh and blood, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to a lifelong slavery. You see what, he, what, what John is saying, whether he knows it or not. He says, look at Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away your sin. Who is he speaking to? He's speaking to Israel. He's speaking to the children. We talked about last week, right? He's the one that initiated baptism for the Israelites who, who thought they were clean. And, and John's saying, you're not clean. The Lamb needs to make you clean. The Lamb needs to take away your sin. The Lamb, lamb needs to, to rescue you from death, that which you're in right now, which you don't even realize. What Sean is saying, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's really saying, behold the work of God. Behold what he's doing. Behold the gospel. That Jesus takes away the sin of the world. That he transfers you from light to death. That he gives you new life. Behold the very nature of the gospel. The work of God. Which is the culmination and the understanding of all the work of God. From beginning to end. In the work of creation. In the work of creating us. In the work of redemption. That this gospel, what God does... Not what we do. The gospel is this very clearly. And John is telling, behold the work of God. It is done. It's not what we are doing. Behold that. We're so interested in how we participate and how we join. And what John is just telling you, behold what God does. What God is doing. What God has done. It, it's, it's the idea of it's grace, it's free leave given versus our opposed our works, all right? And we're so distracted by our works that we forget to look and, and live in grace. That's every moment that God is working. And he's saying, behold the grace. It's the idea of, of beholding that grace instead of begetting, right? Instead of, we're going to make this happen. That's not the gospel, that's, that's works righteousness. That's us, where we do all the time and distract ourselves with this. Ooh, look at what we're doing. Look what we can find out. Instead of taking each and every moment and living in the grace in which God shows us every day, the good news, it's done. The good news is that God works in every moment. The good news is that it's finished for us. We are to behold and bear witness to Jesus. What is Jesus doing? What has he done? John, right, his job is right to prepare and testify, to bear witness to this gospel, to bear witness to this, God, right? We're not in management. John's not in management. He actually is the public orations, and so are we. Our job is to help people behold. Our job is not actually make them behold. Our job is to tell them, behold. Behold God. Behold the gospel. Behold Jesus. Look at God's works. Stop looking at your own. This, this morning, right, I get in my mind that it's my responsibility to help you worship or to get you to worship. And for those that are at home, I get frustrated. Man, I failed them. Here it is. It's not my responsibility. 
It is not my responsibility for you to worship God. Period. It is not. I have some responsibility of beholding myself. I have some responsibility really to tell you to behold. But it is your responsibility every day and every moment to behold. To take that real energy to focus and behold the good news. And the second thing John tells us is to, he bears witness as to, as to who Jesus is. He's telling us who Jesus is, right? He says, and, and if you use Psalm 6, be still. Be still and know who God is. Be still and know who Jesus is. At first, John says, John says this twice, right? He says, in John 131 and 133, he says, I myself did not know him. Now, he knew Jesus. They're cousins. He, he, he physically knew the person. What he's saying is, I didn't know who he actually was until just about now, until God revealed it to me. When this, when this intervention came into the like, whoa, he's God's chosen one. He is the anointed one. John knew who Jesus was. What he didn't know is what, what God just revealed to him in that moment is who Jesus was. Jesus is God's anointed one. He is the Messiah. He is the one that it's the Old Testament is talking about. He is the one that they've been preparing for. He is the one they've been all been waiting for. Jesus is the Lamb of God, which John says, right? Jesus is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Jesus is, he said later on, the Son of God. And that is not subordinate in, in character of who God is. He is God. They're one and the same. The Father and the Son are one. Jesus is God. And that's what he's trying to behold. Behold the work of God and behold God. Behold Jesus. And then we have this incredible, and, and, and the Gospel of John, right from the get-go, is giving us this Trinitarian look at who, who God is. And this is this Jesus spirit connection, John 1, 32-33. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. And I myself did not know him. But he who to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain. This is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Now, when we're told this story before in the other Gospels, it's Jesus that sees the dove descending. It's Jesus that sees, the, sees the, not the dove, the spirit descending upon them like a dove. But here, it's John is given this as a recognition from God, like this is the one that I've been telling you about. This is the reason why I sent you into the wilderness. This is the reason I told you to baptize with water, because this is the chosen one. This is my beloved son, Matthew 3, 16. And when Jesus was baptized, he immediately went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove, coming to the rest of them. Now, Matthew doesn't tell other people saw it, doesn't say they didn't see it. But here we know John saw it as well. The Spirit of God is given to others in the Old Testament, given to others in a moment, but it doesn't always remain. The Spirit of God is given to King Saul for a moment, and then it's taken away. Right, but here, John says it twice. The Spirit remained on Jesus. It doesn't just come and go. It's permanent because the Spirit and the Son are one. Just as the Father and the Son and the Spirit are one. They're always interconnected. They're never apart. Jesus is the archetype and fulfillment of the promise of the everlasting king and kingdom to David and the Spirit descending upon him. 2 Samuel 7, 15. But my steadfast love will not put depart from him, God says, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. What, what, what God is saying to David, look at, I took my spirit away from Saul, but listen, my promise to you is that one day I will give my spirit to the king and that spirit will remain for him and he'll reign forever and ever and ever. That's the promise to David, that the kingdom will have no end. And here it is, Jesus, in which the spirit remains and the kingdom begins forever and ever and will have no end. Very important to understand that. 
The kingdom is not yet to come. The kingdom has already started. And it will not cease. It will only manifest itself more and more. Jesus intercedes on our behalf, living in this, in this baptism of repentance in which, he is, is, which the Spirit descends on him. He lives the life of repentance that you and I can't, fulfilling the covenant of works that you and I can't, the promise of works which God gives to Adam. Jesus fills it. This is the point of why he is baptized. Baptism of repentance, because that's what John does. It's a baptism of repentance. Why would Jesus need to be baptized? He doesn't. But he needs to be baptized on our behalf because we need to repent. And so he's baptized with repentance and then he lives a life perfectly repenting to God on our behalf. John 8, 29. This is what Jesus says. And he who sent me, he who sent me is with me. That remaining, right? He has not left me alone for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Now, you and I can't say that, can we? But here's the great thing. Jesus can say it, and he says it on our behalf because we're united with him. He intercedes on our behalf. Isaiah 11, 1 through 2, this idea that the Spirit comes down and rests upon him, this promise to this, which, which John has referred to. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from its roots shall bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit and counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And then Isaiah 42, 1. Hold on to this one, because John really focuses on this one. Behold my servant, God says, with whom, whom I uphold, my chosen, my anointed, the Messiah, in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. And then Isaiah 61, 1 through 2. This is the, this is the passage which Jesus opened up and reads into the, in the temple. And Luke, when he first announces his public ministry, this is the scroll which he opens up, and Jesus pronounces this one. He says, I fulfilled this today. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me, chosen me, to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of the vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. The spirit descending in this passage is to bear witness and testimony to who Jesus is. Not just, not just his work. God, John talks about that, his sins of the world. He alludes to it, right? But this is to bear witness to who Jesus is. He's God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit united. And in this, right, this idea, this chosen one, this elect, which is that word, the elected one. And John 1 to 34, and I have seen him and bore witness that this is the Son of God. Actually, the translation there in that verse would actually be this, that this is the chosen one of God. I mean, John's sitting this pretty horn. I mean, this is, this is referencing Isaiah 42, that this is the chosen one, the elected one of God. And this concept of God's election and divine action and choice is heavy in the Gospel of John. If you start, I mean, you start reading through the Gospel of John, now that I put this in your ear, you're going to hear this all over the place, where this is God's chosen will, that this is God's chosen one, that this is God's elected one, and that God elects, that it's his will. We get it very, very perverse beginning in John 1.13. You were born, not of blood, not a will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. God chooses. John 6, 65. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. Unless it's God's choice, no one can come to Jesus. John 15, 16. Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that you should, your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, 
he may give it to you. Jesus is the first among us to be chosen, to be elected. I mean, he, you know, he is God. He is the one that elects. But as the example, he is the first, the preeminent, right, in order and in priority. He is the first, the preeminent one. And he is the first in order to be chosen. And we are chosen as well as God's choice upon us. God not only, he not only chose his son eternally to have the spirit. You know what he also chose? He chose us to have the spirit as well too. This is an incredible thing. He chose us for the spirit to remain on us forever. Not that we're one with God, but we have the gift of the spirit that doesn't depart, that stays, because it's his choice, because it's his work, not our work. Behold that. There is not always a clear outward application to Scripture. You kind of read Scripture like, oh, what am I supposed to do? Well, here's what I would tell you. If you read Scripture and your first question is, what am I supposed to do? Read it again. Read it again because that's not the gospel. When you first read scripture, your first question would be, who is God? How should I behold him? What do I need to observe? Who is God and what is he doing? Not, what do I, I mean, there are some outward applications that we can do. But if that's the first question you come for, that's not a gospel-oriented question. You have not understood the scripture correctly. Who is God? What has he done? What is he doing? How do I behold that? How do I be still and know that? We need to spend more time beholding the works of God in Scripture and in every day and in every moment. Beholding the beauty of the gospel. Beholding the beauty of the universe, which is a gift, which is grace defined. God's love defined. And we need to be still and know who God is. Know who Jesus is. Amber preached on this on Psalm 46 a month ago. I don't know if you remember that or not, but I remember it. She preached on it, and in the midst, she said, in the midst of chaos and the trials of God, we need to be still and know that I'm God. And listen, when it, there's chaos and there's trials and there's distractions, the last thing you want to do is be still and be patient. The first thing you want to do, what I want to do, is solve. Solve it so I can find rest. Here's the thing. I have never solved anything and found rest in that or rest that's lasting. I just find more problems. Be still and know in the chaos. In the chaos, you can be quiet. In the trials, you can be still. And you can see God at work. You can know who God is. You can know that he is present. You can know that he is your salvation and you are not. Amber said, his voice is greater than the noise in the world and to stop the frantic activity of your life and look to him. So we're asking every day and every moment. It's what John's saying. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold the Son of God. Behold God's elected one. Know who Jesus is. This, this sermon that I give today is really a prelude uh, to our Anticipate campaign, which starts next week. It's a prelude because here's what I want. You know, this campaign is not a uh, a fundraiser. When we're say right, it is right. I mean, it is right. We we are trying to raise funds to fix this building or buy a new building. We that is what we're trying to do, but that's not what the campaign is about. And here, the campaign is strictly about. We want you to behold and know God. We want you. To, in fact, I would be very comfortable if you did not give money and that's all you did was behold and know who God is. I mean, we want to raise funds, right? So we want you to participate by that. But here's the thing. If you're focused on what you're going to give or how you're going to give or if you're going to give, you have missed the point of the campaign. 
You have missed the point of everything. What I want you to know, why I want you to participate actively with a lot of energy, with a lot of focus, because I want you to know God. And each week, we're going to focus in on who God is, a characteristic of who God is, so that you can know him more personally, intimately. That's what this campaign is about. So we want you to be involved because we want you to grow in your relationship with God. We want you to grow in your intimacy with God. We want you to dive into Scripture together with God. And you may say, I haven't grown with God for a long time. I know him. Great. Good. Amen. I mean, you can say that to your wife. Like, I've known you for a long time. I don't need to spend more time with you, do we? Right? That doesn't work well. Or your husband, right? <laughs> it takes more time and more energy because there's more things to know. And listen, I know our hearts, I know my heart, that we wander and we forget. Take this time to focus on him. Old, what he is doing. Know that he is working in us and for us. And this is the amazing thing. Through us. He is working through you. Oftentimes, most of the time, without you even knowing about it. Because it's not about you. It's not about what you do. I want you to know that he's working in this congregation. I want you to see it. I want you to know that he's working in this congregation regardless of the building, regardless of the facility, that he's working. I want you to know who he is. I want you to know who God is regardless of our decision. Man, we're going to focus, man, we want to be wise and obedient decisions, and we want to follow God. Look at God is going to work regardless of our decision. In spite of our decision, he will work. And whatever decision we make, even if it is not against his will, guess what he will do? He'll turn us. He'll turn us and get back on the right path. Because we are God's chosen one. Because he's given us his spirit to remain. He will reveal to us his overwhelming and amazing grace every day. And I want you to see it. I want you to pay attention. I want you to behold it. And all I'm asking is, can you and can we be a community that trusts in his faithfulness? That trusts in his promises during this campaign? I want us to behold together. And I know it's been hard to be together in this moment. And I know there's reasons why we, some of us have to not be here. And some of us are watching this recording. But we can still be together. But it's going to require a lot of effort, a lot of focus, a lot of uh, effort to think about, I need to be present with you, God. I need to be present with God's people. And how am I going to do that? How am I going to draw up the energy to be present, to behold that God is working, that God is present in each and every moment of my day, that he's present in this community, that he's present with the other people I worship with, can you take the time to focus on that? I want you. We've got opportunities. We're not trying to overwhelm you, but we want you to commit in this season to do that. Morning prayer. Facebook, 730. You don't need Facebook to see the video. You just go to live. Facebook live. You can ask me how I, you can do that. 730. It's recorded. You can watch it later in the day. You don't get up at 730 or you're already at work at 730. You can watch it. Join me Monday through Friday at 7.30, about 10 minutes in the morning as we go through the prayer campaign, as we go focusing on who God is and beholding him. Every Monday evening, we have 7 p.m., about a half hour or less, a Zoom prayer meeting with Jody. He gives a devotion, asks us to share our prayer concerns, and then we pray together. Can you commit to beholding what God is doing and praying for the people of God together? Thursday Bible study. We were at Thursday Bible study this week. It started last week. Join us this week. Join us this week on Zoom, 7 p.m. It's done by 8.15. This week we're done by 8. Commit to that. 
Behold, study the word of God together so we can behold and know God together. Be present and participate on Sunday, whether it's here or at home. Participate. Don't miss a Sunday. Don't miss a Sunday. Commit to it. Commit like, man, I'm going to take this effort and I'm going to behold and know God. I'm going to behold the works of God and I'm going to know who he is. And then we, we want you to pray. We want you the outcome of knowing who God is. We want you to pray and commit your resources, your finances, and ask God, what is it? How is it can I participate financially in this? Maybe he says you can't. I don't know. I'm not going to judge that, right? I will not see what you give. But if you behold and take the time, Behold the works of God. If you behold and you, and you sit still and you take the energy to know who God is, that is transformative. That is, that's the spirit of God working in you. And things will change. Not just your giving. Things will change. And God really wants us to do this every day, in every moment. Take that energy and be still and behold. Will you behold? Will you be still? Will you bear witness to Jesus together? Look at you and I, we just baptize with water. He baptizes with his Holy Spirit. He gives himself to us. I ask you to behold, behold the works of God and know him. Let us pray. Gracious Father, I thank you for lessons each and every day. I thank you that you interrupt my chaos, the chaos that I create. I thank you that you interrupt our distractions to pull us back to you. To even when we, we don't want to behold and we don't want to know, that you pull us back, that your Holy Spirit that dwells within us pulls us back to stillness, to grace to see what you're doing, to see what you've done, and to know who you are in deep, intimate ways. Lord, help us to be really mindful of that today, tomorrow, and the rest of our tomorrows. Help us to be present with you as you are present with us. Help us to behold and know. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said,